In the coming days and weeks, our government will continue to work closely with its partners to ensure that this crash is thoroughly investigated. Canadians have questions and they deserve answers. Tragedy struck today in Iran's capital and sent shockwaves into Canada. A plane departing Tehran for Kyiv's crashed shortly after takeoff. All 176 people on board were killed, including 63 Canadians. Prime Minister Trudeau, as you heard there, is promising to make certain the crash is thoroughly investigated. But without a diplomatic presence in Iran, will that country share its findings with Canada or allow any kind of cooperation? Dennis Horak was Canada's ambassador to Saudi Arabia and head of mission in Iran from 2009 to 2012. He joins us now from Toronto. And next to me here in studio, Thomas Junot is a former Middle East analyst with the Department of National Defense, now with the University of Ottawa. Hello to both of you. Thanks very much for joining us. I appreciate it. Mr. Horak, I'm going to start with you. Uh, we heard the Prime Minister promise to uh, contribute to that investigation as much as possible. He also announced the creation of some kind of consular teams or a set of consular teams that might aid in that process. Can you help us understand realistically given the lack of relationship, diplomatic relationship between Iran and Canada, how feasible any of that is? It's going to be very complicated. Not having a presence in country clearly makes things more difficult to organize. Hopefully the Iranians will be very cooperative on this. This is a human tragedy and hopefully politics don't come into it. What would happen normally is they would try and send a team in either from Ottawa or consular affairs. Our consular affairs are handled by our embassy in, in Ankara, in Turkey. We also have a protecting power in Italy that, that will help out as well. And hopefully we can get some Canadian consular officials either in from Turkey or in from Ottawa, but they're going to need visas, they're going to need approval from the Iranians. Hopefully the Iranians will cooperate, but what we've seen so far, certainly in some of the statements that have come out about uh, not wanting to provide, for example, the black boxes to Boeing or to the United States, perhaps suggests that they won't be as transparent and open as possible or that they'll let politics interfere in this. So. Again, hopefully the Iranians will be, uh, be a little bit more cooperative than we've seen so far. Professor, you know, the, the relationship between Canada and Iran was already, you know, the diplomatic one at least was already non-existent. Then you have all of this happening against the backdrop of the escalation in tensions between the U.S. and Iran. How much harder do you think does that make whatever might be able to happen where this plane crash is, investigation is concerned? It's going to be very difficult, and there's there's no doubt about that. And and I, I completely agree with what uh, Dennis just explained in terms of of, of the, the difficulty of doing this without an embassy on the ground. I think very clearly with an embassy on the ground, it would facilitate it. That being said, we do have to keep in mind that even with an embassy on the ground in Tehran, hypothetically, if we had one, it would be very difficult. Uh, this is the Islamic Republic. In the best of times, they would not be cooperative with uh, the international community, with Canada, with the US, with Ukraine and others to share information, to share the black box, to you know, just to bring in other countries into the investigation. Um, and we're not in the best of times right now because of all the, the, the international tension surrounding recent events. Um, and, and so having an embassy on the ground would be helpful, but would it be a game changer in terms of allowing Canada to really play into this investigation, no, it would still be very difficult. Mr. Horak, you mentioned leaning on other countries and the diplomatic capacity of those countries. We had the ambassador to uh, from Ukraine rather on the show earlier, and he said that there was extensive offers from that country, for example, to utilize their embassy and their staff in that way. Uh, how, how feasible, again, is that, and how, how might that process work? Does it really help that much? I think it will, and a lot of it's dealing also with the relatives that are going to turn up and also dealing with the remains and all of the horrible things that come along with a tragedy like this. So any sort of help on the ground, whether it's by the Ukrainians or other embassies perhaps that we could engage. You know, we have excellent relations obviously with the Australians or the New Zealanders and the UK, all of whom have, bought, have had people on the ground who could help. The Ukrainians I think are going to be busy with themselves, so I think we'll probably be tapping into other embassies as well. And certainly if we can get a consular team in there, we'll, they'll be liaising I think with our normal allies as well as the Ukrainians. Professor Jeannot, can you help uh, our viewers and myself sort of backtrack a few years and go over what led to the end of diplomatic relations with Iran and then uh, perhaps a bit about the, 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 um, the, the way in which you, see, you view this government approaching foreign policy towards that country? 
So very quickly, relations with Iran started degenerating under the Paul Martin government uh, in 2004 to 6. If you remember, there was the Zahra Kazemi episode. An Iranian-Canadian photojournalist was tortured to death in jail. Things started going uh, downwards at that point. Stephen Harper government from 2006 to 15 takes a very hard line on Iran, adopts a number of measures, very harsh rhetoric describing Iran as the greatest threat to international peace and security. That culminates in 2012 with a closure of our embassy in Tehran, the expulsion of Iran diplomats from Ottawa, a number of additional measures, the adoption, for example, of the Justice for Victims of Terrorism Act, which allows uh, individuals, including non-Canadians, to sue the Iranian government in Canadian courts uh, as uh, descendants of victims of terrorism. Fast forward to 2015, the Liberals pledged during the campaign that they will re-establish relations with Iran, they win the election. In 2016 and 17, they actually make a lot of effort to try to do that, but a number of political complications ultimately make that impossible. The legacy of conservative measures, the fact that, uh, you know, ultimately for both Canada and Iran, this was not the highest priority. Uh, consular cases, ongoing ones back in those years make it very difficult. In 2018, the Liberals pretty much freeze these efforts, which were not really working anyways. So in the last year and a half, we've basically been in the status quo. Mr. Horak, the Conservatives have been critical of the Liberals during all of this and, and prior to for not taking a harder line where Iran is concerned. Does that concern, ha does that criticism rather have merit uh, from your perspective? I don't think so. Well, it, the Conservatives basically dropped a poison pill on the relationship with the Justice for Victims of Terrorism Act. But I should say, as I recall, the uh, Liberals also supported that, that bill in Parliament. So it, has, it had bipartisan support and it's been a poison pill on, on the relationship at the time. It's, it was one of the key, if not the key factor leading to the closure of the embassy. And it's been a major obstacle in trying to reopen it as well. So for them to be, now the, the Liberals came in, as Hamas said, that uh, they wanted to, to reopen, but this was, was a problem. I think the Liberals have, have, they have not come out every couple of weeks and called Iran the biggest threat to international peace and security. But the approach that they've taken in terms of uh, being critical of Iran's uh, behavior in the region, uh, you know, the, the, the comments that came out at following the, the death of uh, Soleimani, for example, talking about his, his malign influence across the region, is very consistent with things that, that conservatives would have said in the past. They were critical of the effort to, to or the, the attempt to try and reopen relations. Uh, I think the close, uh, breaking relations was a necessary uh, outcome of the JVTA, but the JVTA itself should have never been, been put forward, and that's been the problem all along. You saw uh, Professor Junot, the Prime Minister, take questions today about what he thinks about the U.S.'s drone strike that killed General Soleimani asked specifically, do you support it? Are you concerned that the evidence that the United States, or the administration rather, cited has not yet been presented or be made public through any means? Uh, he wouldn't go there. How difficult a line uh, does the prime minister have to walk right now where President Trump and Iran are concerned? It's a very difficult uh, balance to find to strike for Canada. And I think that so far, the, the position by the government of taking basically a lowest common denominator, low profile uh, position is probably the right one, at least in the short term. Clearly, you don't want to annoy President Trump at this time by criticizing the, the, the decision to strike Soleimani or criticizing more broadly his maximum pressure campaign on Iran. That would be counterproductive. That being said, I think the prime minister and the government has to, to walk a fine line on the other side too. Uh, maybe not so much now looking forward, that tension seems to be going down a bit. But as long as there was a serious risk of, of conflict in Iraq between the U.S. and Iran, Canada wanted to also be careful not to attract attention on itself from pro-Iran Iraqi Shia militias, for example, from Iran itself. So ultimately, at least so far, I think playing that that very low-profile approach was probably the, the right thing to do. The last question to you, Mr. Horak, just jumping off what Professor Junot says, does the approach or, or will the approach have to change if the outcome of whatever investigation takes place shows there's some kind of uh, nefarious action that was taken that brought down that plane? I don't think so, because I think if there is an investigation and it is shown that this was brought down by an anti-aircraft missile, for example, it would have been an accident. There's no way the Iranians would have targeted this intentionally. Can you be sure of that? Well, there were Iranian citizens on, and I would see no reason why they would do this. This, sort of, this isn't, wouldn't be the first time. I mean, the Americans, I think it was in the late 80s, they shot down an Iranian airliner uh, over the Gulf by accident. And so these things sometimes happen. You had a very high tense period at the time this came down. So if it was an accidental shoot down, I don't, first of all, I don't think the Iranians will admit it, but if it, if it turns out that that's in fact the case, I don't think there should be any repercussions. 
this yeah. time, this happens sometimes. I wonder though if the families, of course, of those 63 Canadians will accept, would accept that. No, that's true. That, that, that would be difficult for them to accept. But, okay. uh, all right, I've got to leave it there, but thank you very much to both of you for your time this evening. Appreciate it. Thanks to Dennis Horak, Canada's former head of mission in Iran, and Thomas Juno of the University of Ottawa. Today, I am going to ask NATO to become much more involved in the Middle East process. The civilized world must send a clear and unified message to the Iranian regime. Your campaign of terror, murder, mayhem will not be tolerated any longer. U.S. President Donald Trump is calling on NATO to step up its presence in the Middle East. Right now, Canada leads a NATO mission in Iraq, which includes coalition troops. Donald Trump spoke directly with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Here's how Trudeau described the conversation. We talked about the importance of continuing uh, the fight against Daesh. We talked about the importance of uh, continuing to stabilize Iraq. And he uh, recognized uh, the important role that the international community can play in, uh, in supporting uh, the move towards uh, a more stable Iraq. Uh, NATO has uh, a uh, significant role in the NATO training mission that we're moving forward with, uh, but there are always going to be more reflections on uh, what are the next steps to take given uh, the current circumstances. So how should Canada respond to tensions between the U.S. and Iran? Hugh Siegel previously served as Chief of Staff to Canadian Prime Minister Brian Mulroney and then as a Senator from 2005 to 2014. Mr. Siegel is now a Matthews Fellow in Global Public Policy at the Queen's University School of Policy Studies. We spoke a bit earlier this afternoon. Hi, Mr. Siegel. Great to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. I want to start off by asking you how you view or what you view Canada's role in all of this as. So much of the discussion, of course, understandably, is focused on the tensions between the U.S. and Iran. What role do you see Canada playing? Well, I think Canada's main role is as a partner in NATO. Um, NATO has been, as our Prime Minister has, um, encouraging restraint on all sides, which I think is a completely legitimate place to be. But we also have to be cognizant of the fact that uh, under Article 5 of the NATO Treaty, and Canada, of course, is one of the founders and drafters of that treaty under Mr. Pearson when he was our foreign minister, if any NATO country is attacked uh, in their own territory, that presents an opportunity and a responsibility for all of NATO to engage in defense of that country. Now, how we engage, of course, is for our own government to decide. Uh, Article 5 talks about the obligation but it doesn't talk about the instrumentality. So for example, in Afghanistan, where Canada was involved as part of the NATO operation against terrorism and in, in response to an invitation from the duly elected government of that country, um, we were there with a full combat presence. We were there with intelligence. We were there with uh, special forces. We were there with a diplomatic presence and we were there with foreign aid on the ground. Um, our German allies, for example, participated. They were up in the north at Mazar al-Sharif. They were not involved in combat. They were involved in other activities. They had caveats. So how one participates is for our government to decide, and that'll be based upon uh, what the chief of the defense staff says we are able to do with the resources we have at hand and what the government of Canada decides is appropriate. But the notion that we have an obligation to engage, I think, is a genuine part of the NATO treaty, and NATO has been a very stabilizing force in many parts of the world, largely in Europe, but in other parts of the world as well. And it's important that we don't forget its, its value at a time of uh, stress and difficulty as we are now going through. Jumping off that point, the president in his press conference earlier today specifically called for, uh, for NATO to um, become, and I think the quote is, become more involved in the Middle East. How did you interpret that? Well, I think um, however Canadians may feel about President Trump on a whole level of uh, different dimensions, the truth of the matter is that most of the oil uh, that comes from the Middle East is for NATO and for Asia. Uh, it's not all that necessary in North America because we have other sources. And the notion that as NATO adapts to a different context going forward, um, that uh, other countries step up and do more, I'm frankly supportive of the notion that Canada and other members of NATO spend more in support of our collective defense responsibilities because that is a expenditure in support of peace and stability. So I'm not troubled by the president's suggestion 
in that respect, but I think it's for every country to decide how best to do that. Certainly, the geographic proximity between Europe and the Middle East makes the Middle East something of more pressing concern, although certainly our country has had a long history of being there on the ground in the Middle East, peacekeeping and other activities in support of stability and countries working together as effectively as possible. Let me circle back to the point that you made on Article 5, which, uh, just for our viewers, is the collective mutual defense article that gives, in, in essence, gives NATO its strength. It only, my understanding is, it only applies to an armed attack against one or more NATO members in Europe or North America. Do you think that there is the potential for that, given what you've seen so far uh, in this, in this uh, set of tensions between the U.S. and Iran? I would argue that the Iranians have shown a measure of restraint in the response. If you looked at the outpouring of grief and anger on the streets uh, after the, uh, the death of that particular uh, head of the Al-Quds force, um, I think the Iranian government has tried to set a message that they did have to do something. They had to show the anger and frustration of their people, but they are not looking to escalate. Uh, and I think the Americans have said the same thing. So I think we have a window here for everybody to take a breath uh, and pause for a moment. And I think it's also an opportunity, quite frankly, for NATO, which has been calling for restraint, to begin to consider, and I would suggest this should be at the ministerial level, what it is um, NATO should now be thinking about in terms of a future configuration and engagement should we have more difficulty in the Middle East. But NATO has had what I would call out-of-territory uh, commitments. Um, Afghanistan was not in the normal frame of reference, but it was a NATO commitment that was part of stability. And of course, NATO has an ongoing concern about Russian adventurism, and we need to remember that the Russians and the Chinese and the Islamic Republic of Iran together had NATO, na had, sorry, had naval exercises uh, just last week. So the notion of there being another alliance that might be on the other side of this debate is something I think we have to be cognizant of. Just before I let you go, when you mentioned it, and many others have as well, that both the U.S. and the Iran, and Iran rather, uh, seem to exercise some level of restraint, and you talk about that window of opportunity. What are you looking for? What do you? What do you? What is possible in that window to try and sustain the de-escalation? If in fact that's what this turns out to be, and I, and I don't want to prejudge it because we don't know what's going to happen in the next 24 hours. Yeah, I would say that the United Nations, an organization in which Canada believes fundamentally, has an opportunity here not to have a Security Council meeting which is about one side blaming the other side and back and forth with the various vetoes being used by the permanent members, but to have a broader discussion of what can be done in the international context get get the different sides talking to each other around some areas of mutual potential cooperation. There was an exchange of prisoners a few uh, weeks ago before the present provocations and uh, I think that um, looking for those signs of avenues I think is a very good way forward to try to keep the cool in the discussion and try to build some constructive diplomatic ground for progress going forward. All right, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Mr. Siegel. Pleasure to have you on our program tonight. Thank you. Hugh Siegel, Matthews Fellow in Global Public Policy at the Queen's University School of Policy Studies. Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.